So is this a nice wee story of cuddly sheep and caring shepherds or another outright provocation? Well, if you've even been listening to Jesus and his tone of voice, what do you think? All who came before me were thieves and robbers. So, meek and mild or turning over table? No accident then that the word for sheepfold is the same as the palace of the high priest. Having a go at the power and privilege that was wielded over the spiritual enclosure of God's house for all nations, which Jesus defended and cherished. How would it feel to hear from the trustworthy voice of Jesus that the whole cultural and economic system on which you rely is built on robbery? And would that sound familiar in our world, where the greatest impact is felt by those who contribute least to it? No accident then that Jesus identifies the Good Shepherd as the one who comes and goes by that same humble door to the enclosure, as do the sheep. And those who enter, not climbing through the window, but climbing up like thieves and robbers, have that in common with the thieves and robbers, that they climb up to the privileged entrance. This is a holy wolf of a story in sheep's clothing, so we shouldn't undersell it, nor anything we read or preach from it. Preaching is now. And of course, right now, for anyone concerned with the environmental crises, to talk of sheep is to tread on very sensitive ground indeed. Like cattle, sheep burp methane, that abundantly potent greenhouse gas, which dissipates, of course, so much faster than CO2. If you can do something about methane, you can get somewhere quickly. Though it doesn't make sense to look for change in one place only. As we're now discovering, there are many ways to clear the air, and all of them cost someone somewhere something, as well as giving benefits for all. And since, as in environmental matters, perfectionism is pretty well as toxic as denialism, so when reflecting on concrete reality, we need to hear not just the words, but the voice of Christ leading us out into the pasture of the world. But maybe you don't see the connection. Christ expects us to read the signs of the times, to be mindful in so many ways to our place in creation to the voice of creation, to the seasons, the climate, the lot. Methane globally is a contributor to global overheating. And yet the habits and the dung of ruminants condition the soil and bring the carbon back down. And protein is vital in human diets. Now it's beyond the scope of this video to establish where the balance should lie. But care for life and life's abundance, for human and animal welfare, a perception of a robust relationship with fellow creatures, that has got to be part of any Christian engagement. Without love in all its richness or abundance, we ourselves are thieves and robbers. Because life is better than, richer than the facts and figures that might describe it. And as Pope Francis has so clearly articulated, neither morally nor logically can you be a Christian environmentalist and disregard human poverty and injustice. So there are arguments to be had and decisions to be made, and it's unlikely anyone has a 100% watertight position. To do anything at all, we have to do something costly and imperfect. We also need courage to be committed without full understanding to trust the voice of love and justice, to be led like the sheep, even if they don't grasp every word of what the Good Shepherd is saying. And leaving aside meat production, wool is of course a fabulous natural fibre. Great for insulation, it's breathable, and many uses still to be discovered. And of course, it's not made of plastic. In Scotland, it's often suggested that putting sheep there is all that can be done with the great open grassy spaces that have been as they are since the clearances. 
Others suggest our landscape might be extensively reforested the way it was until the Vikings came and burnt it down. All of these are voices we need to listen to and none of them I'd suggest are robbers and bandits because thieves and bandits are those to whom relationship is irrelevant. And that's an ignorance worse than malice. To exploit is not to care about the harm we do. And yes, factory farms and battery hen enclosures tend towards that sort of brutality where an animal passes its whole brief life without even getting a whiff of something like pasture. And that's a brutality shared, it has to be said, by every economic system where it isn't welfare or the richness of life but profit that is the determinant of everything. Where the kingdom of God just has to wait in line. Where spirituality, that great healing power that changes minds without having to face disaster first, is seen as irrelevant. When the good shepherd leads sheep to pasture, they are led and not force-fed. You can't be saved by force. Let that sink in. An unfortunate local preacher once asked a congregation in a farming area what they do with their sheep and the answer that they got was, we slaughter them. When we read the Bible we face things head on and we also need to know we have permission, as did Jesus, to pick and choose. When we're fishing for people we don't net them, asphyxiate them, bash them on the head, cook them and eat them. And yet at the same time it's right to pick something up and run with it. Like the idea that it's time to see the shepherd's gift of abundant life applied more widely than just human life. All that said, the rooting of the story in the realities of sheep and their nearly symbiotic relationship with the despised shepherds gives the story an additional depth and power. If you've ever seen a sheepdog trial, the bolshiness of sheep is par for the course. In this story, the sheep are strictly, with their consent, recipients of care. They're destined not so much for the freezer or the barbecue, but for abundant life. And perhaps, as you may have noticed when you last got lost in the hills, sheep are pathfinders. They're vulnerable, but not entirely helpless. In this story, sheep make decisions. They say yes or no to leaders. And their trust has to be earned. So while they may or may not make much of the words, they're no fools as to who cares and who doesn't. Some of you might find this passage provocative because of the distinctiveness of what Jesus is looking for, as if he's the definitive door, as if no one had anything else to offer. Try seeing it this way, that if you're not deeply concerned about the welfare of the planet, about poverty and inequality, about the abundance and happiness of all the life that God the Creator commissioned to fill up the earth, sea and skies, Maybe the door you're queuing up at is not that of Jesus Christ. So if you're for justice, for diversity and abundant life, you'll know which voice to listen for. No exclusiveness there.